What I want to share with you really is, is something that I, I really have spent my lifetime researching and seeking. Um, it's really how to have the secret to a happy life. And for me, um, I really, from a young age, I really did not want my life to go to waste. I, I wanted to have a life of meaning. I wanted to have a life of purpose and I wanted to have a happy life. And, and I felt those were the same as well. I've spent a, a lot of my time uh, researching that and trying to find out really um, how, how to be able to do that. But as I was preparing for this talk, I realized that really, for me, the secret to a happy life has also worked into me for how to have a healthy organization. Because I, I loved doing what I do. I loved working in schools. I loved leading and being a part of a leadership team, all those different things. And so for me, you're getting a little bit of both. I don't know how many of you have watched um, Robert Waldinger, um, his TED Talk. It, back in 2015, he was, um, he, he, he was talking about how to live a good life. And, and what he did, he's a part of a study that was really started back in 1938, and he's the, the third person that's in charge of this study, but, but, and so it hasn't, he hasn't been in charge of it since 1938, but really they were looking at a longitudinal study, taking a look at, at really um, human development. And I'm, I'm a part of these 30 million views for sure. Um, I, don't, I can't say I did them all, but it, it really is a, a, um, a pertinent topic for people. And what this study that he uh, really looked at, it was the Harvard Study of Human Development. And they, they had um, 268 Harvard students. They were sophomores back in 1938, and they were all males. And it, it wasn't that they purposely chose men for the study. It was they were doing the study at Harvard, and Harvard was an all-male school at the time. Eventually, they, they expanded the study. They originally had these 268 students, then they, they or 200 sophomore students, then they expanded into their families. And so then they started looking at these other, their, their offspring, and there was 1,300 of them in their offspring. And then they also, then in the 1970s, they added um, another 456 uh, people into the study. And these, these people were from inner city, the inner city Boston. And in, the, in their study, they had, uh, they had a U.S. president, they've had a number of CEOs, professors, doctors, lawyers, but also drug addicts they, and, and people, uh, schizophrenia. They, 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 they just took a look at their lives and they just did, um, really took a look at what it is that they were thinking in their whole human development in, in what they were doing. Now, the, the thing that they asked them right at the very start was, what did they want out of life? What were they looking for in life? What were their goals? What, and what did they think would make them happy? And really, they came up with really probably the same things that I would have had when I was in my 20s, really looking for wealth, thinking that wealth would really make, make me allow me to determine how happy I really was, looking for fame, which, whatever fame that is, whatever, whether it, it's in the movie industry or just in your own industry, government, whatever it was, but then also uh, looking at power and what it is that um, thinking that the wealth, fame, and power would really make and create a, 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 a happy life for them. But what, what they did is they took a look and they w took a look at what the different lessons that they learned. And they learned, first of all, that wealth, fame, and power does not equal happiness. It, it just it was not a determinant. So in, instead of just saying, you know, are you happy or whatever, they, they just took a look and said, trying to, to, to drill down into what really made people happy. And, and if somebody was wealthy, it did not mean that they were happy. If somebody was, was very famous, it didn't mean that they were happy. So there was just no equation between, between these and then happiness. But one thing they did find was that happiness did come from having healthy relationships. That those who had healthy relationships were really the happiest people as well. But that one thing that they didn't expect and when, when they're looking at is that really healthy relationships also then also equaled healthy lives. They, it, it was really interesting. They took a look at the, they, they went back in time and took a look at all these individuals that were uh, when they were 50 years old. 
And they said the people that had the healthiest relationships, those that were the most comfortable in their relationships at the age of 50, were the healthiest at the age of 80. And they, they, didn't, they said you can't discount physical fitness and healthy eating, all those different things. But none of those correlated directly to who was, who was the healthiest. The thing that correlated directly was really those that were in healthy relationships. And, and when he defined healthy relationships, he, he really talked about um, j just maybe just having one person that you knew was committed to you and you were committed to them. It could be a multiple people, it could be a community, but you had to have some connection, some relationship that you knew, it didn't really matter what you did, the person would be committed to you and stay true to you in, in, their, in their relationship. And that determined how healthy they were. The, the, the thing that they, they really discovered, they found that loneliness just kills. It, it, they found it at, to be as deadly as smoking, to be as deadly as alcohol addiction, drug addiction, that loneliness was a, 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 as big a determining factor of uh, premature death than anything else. And, and so finally they came out with, and they, and they just really were saying that community, community matters. And it, it matters that we feel that we're a part of a community, that we get a sense of community. Now, um, I know I'm talking um, really as a head of school, and oftentimes I will tell our students there's, there's really something that's very important to be successful this year. And, and the thing that they, they discovered in this study was that not that um, read, read, read was that important. Instead, it was relationships, relationships, relationships are really what we need in order to have a happy and healthy life. Now, so th that was just one thing that I looked at in, in and, and I really did, I watched that in 2015. I was an early adopter to finding out the, the good life. But another one actually was um, the, this uh, lady, Bronnie Ware. Um, Bronnie's a really interesting lady. She, she, she was a palliative care nurse so really, she took care, in Australia, she took care of people in their, their last days of their life. And, and she, so, so she wasn't going into their homes to try and, and help them get better, to help them get well. Instead, she was just trying to help them die well, to, so that they felt um, good and cared for in their last dying days. And so, and Bronnie was really good at her job, and, and, and it's interesting, she, 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 she talks about how um, everybody, everybody in their dying days wants to come to peace in their life. And she said that there was nobody, nobody that she cared for were not able to get to that point of, of really saying that I, I, I don't have regrets and I, I'm at peace with my life. And so, but, but what she did and she started to do was she started to ask the, the, these people questions. And, it, and it's really interesting, when you ask somebody that has nothing to lose, that they're, they're, they become truly authentic in, in what it is that they're telling you. And so she asked these people, what is it that you regret? And that's really where she got the name of the book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. It, it's a really interesting read, and it's a really interesting book. If you, if you want to know the other five, I'm going to share one with you today. But they're really interesting things about if you don't want to live a life of regret, there's these five things to try and avoid. Number two was, I wish I had not worked so hard. I worked fairly hard, and I was happy working hard. And my father was a grain buyer, and so you couldn't get any more blue collar. He carried his, his lunch bucket to work, and he just loaded grain bins all day. He bought grain from farmers and loaded them up in boxcars and sent them off to ports all around Canada. And, and it just... He, he just had this incredible work ethic. I don't, I don't ever remember my father missing a day of work. And that's one thing that he really taught me, is that it's, it's just so important. So when I, when I bump up into, I wish I hadn't worked so hard, it, it kind of, well, it, it speaks to me a bit. But the other thing for my father was that uh, community was very important for him. But 
but his family was very important. So whenever he did have time, whenever he, he wasn't at work, he was, we, were, we, had, we just had incredible family holidays, but they were all just, you know, grabbing the tent and throwing it in the, in the, in the station wagon and finding our way and going and finding a, a campsite. But it was, it was always fun. It was always things that we did as a family. And so I'm taking a, and, and once again, I'm just walking you through the, the journey that I've walked through in, into who I am right now. But the thing is that I knew, I knew that relationships were important. I knew that. And, and I know they are. But then I, I, you also bump into, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And so how do I, how do I reconcile that? Because I really, I like my job. I like my work. I get lots of satisfaction for showing up at work and, and doing the things that I do. And so the thing that I kept asking myself is, can you have success and healthy relationships? It, can, the, can, the two, can the two coexist? And because I wasn't exactly sure. I, when I was at work, I felt guilty for being at work because I needed to be at home. And then when I was at home, and I felt like I needed to should be at work. And so I, the, the two really didn't uh, coincide with each other. But I, then I came across a book um, by Michael Lindsay, and it's called uh, View from the Top. And this is really, once again, and um, reading I do believe is important. Um, and, and that's not all that I do. But, but um, so he wrote a book, uh, and, it, and w in that book, um, he interviewed 550 leaders. And, and it took him a decade to do it. But it, this was a qualitative study. He was actually doing it for his dissertation uh, in Princeton. And, and he, he was trying to look at how do you get to the top, first of all, how do you get to the top? Then are, who is happy when they are at the top? And then how do you stay at the top? And, and so he, he just looked at, um, and he, he just would find these people, write them, ask them if he could interview them, and then, uh, and then go and sit down and just take notes. And, and it took him a decade to, do, to interview these 550 leaders. And the thing that, and so the, it, there was just a whole vast of, of leaders that he, he talked to. But the thing that he, he discovered is that wealth is just not a predictor of success. So, and, and he talked about not wealth when they, where they are now, but instead wealth when they were born. So if they were born into wealth, was it a predictor that they would become a, a top, at the top of their uh, industry, the top of their com uh, company? And, and wealth just had nothing to do with it. Um, college really didn't matter. And uh, working longer hours didn't mean that you got to the top. It, it didn't mean that you were better at what you did. And so, so then I, I asked myself, um, can leaders really have it all or not? And, and this is the thing that I found really interesting in his book. And he says, yes, leaders can have it all. But having it all means that you have to narrow your focus to just the two things that you want. And so for me, this really resonated with me because really relationships were really important for me. And then doing good work, doing meaningful work, being good at what I did was important to me. And so, but, but that's really what he said. You can work 70 hours a week, but you have to take all of your other time and devote it to what your your other goal is, and, and, and that's relationships. And once again, he talked about, for most people, relationships was family, whether it was husband, wife, you know, children, or even father, sister, brother. But it was also um, just really needing relationships. It could be just with friends as well, and, and it could be a part of your community. And the thing that he found was that you had to really um, build in customs. He called them customs. You need customs in your daily life, weekly life, monthly life, that get built into your routine so that everybody knows what to expect, that your, your, your friends know what to expect, your family knows what to expect. And so whether it was a, a weekly basketball game or it was a, a dinner party that happened every week or something happened every month where everybody knows that they can count on you to show up, whether it was... Uh, Dinner time was sacred, Sundays were sacred, whatever it is, build in these customs in these times where, where the people that matter most to you really then um, know that they can count on you and, and are, are part of it. But so, 
for me, this is, now once again, this is just my journey and I'm just walking you through. Um, how do you create a community where together is better? Because I, I, I indicated at the start, together is better, is, is really what I want in my organization, the organization that I work in and work with, the people I work with, but how do you make that happen? And this, I have to say, is, is I'm really not going to go into a bunch of research on, on different things. It's really just kind of my own life experience now. And, but once again, I am going to dive into uh, some books. But, but for me, it's love. And, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about the feeling, you know, you get that fluttery feeling or um, puppy love or anything like that. Love for me is very much action. It's what do we do? What are the things that we do to demonstrate love or to show love? That for me is like if, if and, and so really, um, the, the, these two books, Love Does, is really all about just action. Love is action. How are you, how are you showing love? How are you being um, mindful in what you're doing and being loving? And then the other one is, is really Love Wins. And, and for me, that just is a, a great title. It's, it's just something I believe. I believe that in the end, love wins. But it only is if you really take a look and show what, what love is. And so for me, defining love is, is really from um, a writer back in, back in the day. Paul wrote a, a letter that has survived. And, and he really goes through and he describes what love is. And for me, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about love within an organization. Love within relationships. It's not a feeling, it's, it is these things. And, and, and I think if we can get these things right, then you can have it together is better right. But anyway, so um, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, it does not delight in evil, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. And for me, that is how you can have better is to get, together is better. That is how you can have it. And so for me, love always wins, but you also have to work hard. You need, you need to know People know that they need to be able to count on you, that you're competent at what you do. That all those things, you can't do it. All those patience and kindness, all those things, they would just fall apart if you weren't doing what you had to do. And, that you were, and, and so for me, that is how now we can have that together is better and we work hard. Thank you.